what are the best westerns in the history of cinema? Is it the good, the bad, and the ugly? Unforgiven. No Country for Old Men. Hell or High Water. The Revenant. Let's break down our top 20 westerns of all time. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. And today we're breaking down the greatest western films of all time. This is a genre that we grew up loving. I remember when I was 18, 19 years old. I became obsessed with American Westerns, and I watched all of them. I was just like, all the Spaghetti Westerns, all the great classics, the John Ford Westerns. I was just in my movie dungeon, the basement. The basement at the house. Watching these on Netflix by mail. Anthony's movie dungeon. One after each other, churning them out. And I just always thought that Clint Eastwood was one of the coolest guys to ever be on screen before. And the Western genre is really important to the, the cinema experience of the 60s and 50s. John Ford basically was the father of the genre with movies like Stagecoach and then uh, Rio Brave and then really expanding on the visual language of what a Western can be. And then other great filmmakers like John Huston came in board, came on board as well, Sergio Leone and the other Italian filmmakers. And then Clint Eastwood himself has directed a shit ton of Westerns. Quite a few, including a Best Picture winning Western. And Westerns are as American as baseball. They're as American as football, American football at least, <laughs> not football in Europe. Apple pie. Around the rest of the world. But Rodeo. It's part of our culture, Western films. They've always been a staple in cinema. There was a boom, like you said, mid-20th century where Westerns were so popular, so hot. It died down a bit in the 90s and 2000s. Not a ton getting made. You could say right now Quentin Tarantino is the Western filmmaker of America. At the Tyler moment. Sheridan, I would say, Tyler as Sheridan, well. too, yeah. as, well as, with, as well as television yeah. with Yellowstone and his shows. So he's a current Western filmmaker. But it seems like the – the genre is coming back in a big way, I feel like, especially in television with shows like 1883, Yellowstone. There's kind of always that, that fever for Westerns are coming back, and I like it because I miss I miss Westerns. Superheroes have taken over the century for sure, a lot of horror as well. But now that superheroes are maybe dying down a little bit and video games are booming, maybe Westerns have a chance to come back in a big way. There's an appetite for the storytelling genre because even if the pure western hasn't been as popular in the last two decades as it used to be the genre is still being used in other films it'll be films with a, a western twist or a western approach logan is a great example of a, a superhero film that's bent like a western and it feels like a western and then tarantino obviously using western in the western genre and tropes in many of his movies so even if we don't, aren't getting pure westerns we're getting the Western influence, for sure, in a lot of modern films. And on top of that, you said video games. Red Dead Redemption 2 is one of the most beloved, if not the most beloved, video game of all time. So there's an appetite for the Western storytelling. And I think that there could be a real resurgence. Ari Oster's next film is a Western. So I think that there could be a great resurgence for this genre going forward. Also, the Coen brothers have been big contemporary Western filmmakers as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, you could say yeah. that in a lot of ways— Fargo at times is a Western, even though technically a Western takes place in the South. It can take place in the Midwest, in the mid of America. So a lot of Westerns usually had that requirement of being in the South mixed with on the border. Well, Mexico yeah, and the United American States. frontier. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't just have to be the South. It can yeah, be the exactly. West. But I mean, a yeah. lot of movies have taken on yeah. like it's very much in the South, Texas, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Nevada. But then going up north a little bit, but then yeah. south. And, and obviously the border plays a major role in a lot of Western stories and films like Cormac McCarthy. Almost all of his books take place on that border of Mexico and Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, No Country for Old Men, All the Pretty Horses, uh, tons of his movies, and, ton and Blood Meridian, which is a book that is impossible to adapt. So he's just a prevalent American writer was R.I.P. Yeah, he passed Cormac away MacArthur, this past year. But he wrote so many great stories that have been adapted into films that maybe one or two are on this list. Yeah, and when I think of the purest sense of the Western, it's I would say the it has to take place within the American frontier. But I think that the Western genre should be expanded, and we have with this list where there are films that take place in different areas of the country as well as we have a couple of contemporary films that might surprise you and there's a couple films on here that you can question, is it a Western or is it not? But we do think that everything on this list is a Western. Yeah, you don't have to have guns. You don't have to have horses, especially if it's a contemporary Western. You can sort of replace horses with motorcycles or replace them with cars. Yeah. But I feel like 
a true western, you gotta have guns at some point. It doesn't have to be a revolver. It doesn't have to be like a like a single shot twenty caliber rifle. It can be guns in any kind of weapon. You know yeah. what I mean? But I think that even a movie like Kill Bill Volume Two, that's very much a western. It has a western feel to it. But it doesn't have to have horses. It doesn't have to have revolvers. And that's, I mean, the Wild West. It was just the exploration of the, Wee, un untapped, <laughs> the untapped geography of America. And, James, you're wearing a fucking great hat. Thank you. That's a, fa that's a real cowboy hat. It is. It's from Texas. Texas. I have a uh, Indiana Jones hat. But yeah, yours, yours is close enough. Yours is real. This is an authentic cowboy hat from Texas or a legit 10-gallon yeah. hat. It actually looks pretty good on you. not going to lie. It was made by... What's it called? Clint Eastwood made Cavenders, it. Cavenders, which is a big, um, yeah, Cavenders is a big brand out there in Texas. They got a whole chain of stores. They sell all kinds of gear mm -hmm. for cowboys. Nice. Boots, shirts, hats, <laughs> flannels, jeans, everything you need. Ever have anyone come here without any clothes on? No, it's unusual. It's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> How about you uh, take it away? With the first film on our list from 20 to 1. What's at number 20, James? At number 20, we have a newer film. The Revenant, which came out all the way back in what was this, 2017? What year did The Revenant come out? Did you 2015, put 2015? It's right 2015? there. 2015? Yeah. Where? It's on the I bottom. We're on the list. On oh, the very bottom, December yeah. 16th, 2015, obviously directed by Alejandro Inyari, who starring Leonardo DiCaprio. This was an Oscar winning film. Rotten Tomatoes, it's only a 78% low score for critic and 76 percent audience score which is wild because when i think of the revenant i think of what it's one of the best movies in the last five to ten years it's really incredible and imdb it's an 8.0 which is an excellent score anytime you're at eight or higher it's great now this film takes place in the american frontier what's the year of the film it's got to be 1820s 1823 i believe something is the like year that of the Revenants follows Hugh Glass, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, based on a true story of him being attacked by a bear while leading people on an expedition for pallets. Pelts. 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 They're, looking, they're not looking for color pallets. They're yeah. looking for pelts. Pelts. Furs. <laughs> as well as clashing with indigenous tribes and locals of the world. And, you know, this kind of has a ambiguous territory of some of it can take place in Canada but coming into America. So if French the French taking over Canada just like the uh, the British and colonizers taking over America. They sort of had a same kind of lifestyle of as they were integrating into the culture Hence and just, French Canadian and just gaining ca gaining territory. Hence French Canadian, but the Revenant is really sensational filmmaking. We've done an episode on it. Well, we did an episode on The Revenant and Birdman, which yeah. was a great two-parter and breaking two those movies together was was really such a great time but the revenant i think is a really special movie because of the practical filmmaking of using all natural light except for just one sequence of a fire sh of of a, a fire they had to use some artificial lighting to enhance the lighting on leonardo DiCaprio, who suffered for this role you know that whole method acting and putting yourself through hell you know sometimes it pays off sometimes it doesn't for actors but i think it absolutely paid off for leonardo DiCaprio. and it seemed like he was willing to do anything to get this oscar and this academy award this is just a a brilliantly directed film the uh, in terms of it being a a period piece it's it's one of the best in the last decade for sure i really love the revenant it's an excellent book as well it's pretty di the movie's different from the book in a lot of ways because they want you to empathize with the character hugh glass a lot more mm -hmm. like having a son who gets killed by one of the one of the uh by tom hardy's character Fitzgerald. 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 But it's terrific. It's entertaining. It's artistic as hell. And it's a terrific, terrific movie. Wildly successful, too. Yeah, it was $500 huge million. Dollars. Huge hit. People love westerns. All right, next up at number 19, we have the first, but not the last, Clint Eastwood film on this list. The Outlaw Josie Wales. <laughs> which Maybe is the best poster on this list. Fantastic poster. It's a 7.8 on IMDb, 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, only a 3.8 on Letterboxd. However, I think it's really fantastic, which is why we put it on this film. And it was also one of Clint Eastwood's first films. It was his second film as a director. And this stars him as Josie Wales, who watches helplessly as his wife and child are murdered by Union men led by Captain Terrell, played well by Bill McKinney. Seeking revenge, Wales joins the Confederate Army. He refuses to surrender when the war ends, but his fellow soldiers go to hand over their weapons and are massacred by Terrell. Wills, down, Wills then guns down some of Terrell's men and flees to Texas where he tries to make a new life for himself, but the bounty on his head endangers him and his new surrogate family. 
This is also, I think, just one of Clint Eastwood's best performances. He's really fantastic in this film. He is one of the best at playing that lone man, that lone wolf in the wilderness, uh, the gunslinger, the ultimate just kind of predator in the wild, wild west. Excellent villain. Really great shootouts in this film. Horse chases. Uh, the scenery is fantastic. And it was really impressive for being an early filmmaking debut for Clint Eastwood. He made um, Play, Play Misty for me in 70. I believe 70, and then he made this film after that. So this is his second film as a director. Very impressive. set pieces, tons yeah. of extras, just great practical filmmaking, really incredible shots too. And, you know, like having massive battles and mm -hmm. a ton dudes on horses, just tons of people on horses. You know, movies don't really get made like this anymore in terms of the practical elements. Obviously, Lord of the Rings is like comes to mind. Gladiator comes to mind of these epics with tons of extras, yeah. great wardrobe and weaponry. But it's it's a really impressive movie. It's excellent. It's so good. And again, maybe one of the coolest posters in cinema history. He's just two revolvers ah, screaming. screaming. Yeah, ready to go. I love it. I love it. Great that with a beard, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Next up on our list at number 18, we have a remake from 2007. We have 310 to Yuma, which was directed by James Mangold, starring Christian Bale and Russell Crowe. 89%. Critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, seven point six on IMDb, which you know seems kind of, kind of fair. It's way better than that. I think it's better than seven point yeah. six, but I get it. And now it stars Russell Crowe as an outlaw named Ben Wade, just a really badass name who's terrorizing Arizona in the eighteen hundreds, especially the Southern Railroad, until he's finally captured. Now Wade must be brought to trial, so Dan Evans, the owner of a drought-stricken ranch, volunteers to help escort him to the train, the three ten. To Yuma State Prison, along the trail, a grudging respect from forms between the men, but danger looms at every turn, and the criminals men are in pursuit. And basically, it's it's a, I wouldn't say it's so much a chase movie as it's, it's a uh, travel. It's movie. a travel movie. <laughs> it's you a know? slow chase. They're not really getting chased. It's by like Butch Cassidy. Anyone in particular? Yeah. They are getting chased by Ben Wade's men. However, they're also dealing with indigenous tribes, which is obviously yeah. a common theme in many Western films. But really, it's a, it's a movie about respect because these two men who are polar opposites despise each other, mm -hmm. can't stand each other, end up becoming great friends by the end of the film, and willing to put their lives in the line to make sure that he gets on the train and Ben Wade's willing to go to prison to make sure that Dan Evans gets paid so that he can save his family, save his ranch. So so it's really terrific, the chemistry they have on camera together between Russell Crowe and Christian Bale. And this is Christian right after doing Batman Begins, so he's becoming a household name, very popular Obviously, Russell Crowe was one of, the, one of the biggest stars on the planet at the time, but Christian Bale really proved that he could be the next big star also, even though he was Batman, but again, proving himself alongside an A-lister like Russell Crowe. Yeah, it's a fantastic Western. It's also one of the better remakes ever made. Yeah, I would say that. Mangold improved upon the original in a couple of ways. First of all, making uh, uh, Dan Evans uh, injured war vet with one leg. Really, They really tackled that well and then let you connect with him with empathy uh, with the sadness and, and regret in his eye in his in his uh, soul and that was something the uh, original film didn't have it was a little more charming and then also um the, it has a different ending from uh, the first film i won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen either films but uh it the 310 yuma remake by james mangold had a has a really fantastic brilliant ending uh, that I think ends on a much better note than the original film. The original film is it's a more uplifting finale, and and James Mangold's film I think made a much more interesting uh, choice with how he ended his picture. Great third act too, awesome yeah. shootouts, great action, awesome stunt work. So I, I love the third act of Three Ten to Human. Fantastic, so much. fantastic stuff. And Ben Wade is just so cool. Also, Marco Beltrami's score is fantastic. Yep, really and great composer. Great early role from Ben Foster as well. Mm -hmm. He's terrific as yeah. the outlaw in this. Boss! <laughs> He's great. <laughs> All right, next up, at number 17, we have our first Sergio Leone film. There will be many more. We have the first film in the Man With No Name trilogy, A Fistful of Dollars, which came out in January 1967. This is a 7.9 on IMDb and 98% on Rotten Tomatoes and a very low 65% on Metacritic. So this is a... Uh, 56% on Metacritic? Yeah. What's up with you, Metacritic? 65. Jeez. Oh, 65. Still, Still low. Still kind of low. Still low. It's pretty interesting how harsh they are on, on, are on some great all-time movies, mm -hmm. but then there's so lenient on a lot of new movies that come out that just aren't great. Yeah. It's, 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 it is it's it is what it is. But this is fantastic, and 
this is it's the weakest of the trilogy, and that's not really saying that that's that's really saying something because it's an amazing film. It's really interesting, and it it shows the the stranger. I like to call me the stranger, the male no name. The stranger is more a little bit more nefarious than in the other films, uh, because he arrives at a town, and there's two major rival parties in the town, two rival gangs, and rather than joining either one of them, he actually uses it to their advantage because. Uh, in the opening of the film, a caravan of gold with Mexican soldiers was taken out and the gold was stolen. And so he comes up with this plan and a series of tricks to basically pit both sides against each other. It's really brilliant, like strategically, what he does to uh, get the others to attack one or vice versa and betray people. And so he's always playing the parties uh, very uh, strategically and it's really well done. Uh, it's an interesting story. It th What doesn't put it over the edge like the other two it doesn't have quite a, a big villain like uh fistful like for a few dollars more or the good and bad and the ugly um but that being said it is a really fun time great shootouts and it's just such a fun western this also is the one where Clint Eastwood famously wore the chest plate under his his clothing to fool one of the villains and they shot him in the chest a bunch of times and he's like still up and then he throws the chest plate down he's like haha what's up motherfucker <laughs> that's not what he says but <laughs> it's a great film Beautiful music from Ennio Morricone, great cinematography. And what's interesting about the early two films of the trilogy is both uh, Leone, his DP, and an Ennio, it seemed like the three of them were just like figuring out how to crack the code of the Western. And this is like an early step forward, leading obviously into one of the greatest films of all time, which we'll get into a little bit. But I love A Fistful of Dollars. The movie that'll make you thirsty too. Yes, very thirsty. Going after that carriage in the desert. <laughs> like when they do um, Clint Eastwood's close-up and his lips are just like coming apart. <laughs> so chapped. Yeah, so, it's the oh most chapped list I've ever seen so in a movie. <laughs> Almost dies out there, man. It's pretty great. Let's move on to another all-timer. At number 16 on our list of the best westerns of all time, we have High Noon. Came Good out in 1952 from Fred Zinneman as director. 8.0 on IMDb. 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. Four out of five. Out of five on Letterbox. This one stars Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly before she are retired. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never be, not be sad about that. <laughs> Love of my life, Grace Kelly. <laughs> Former Marshal Will Kane is preparing to leave the small town of Hadleyville, New Mexico, while his new bride, with his new bride Amy, played by Grace Kelly, when he learns that local criminal Frank Miller has been set free and is coming to seek revenge on the Marshal Tournament. When he starts recruiting deputies to fight Miller, Kane is discouraged to find that the people of Hadleyville turn cowardly when the time comes for a showdown. He must face Miller and his cronies alone. Great movie, incredible production design, excellent shootouts. This is a black and white 1952. It's a pretty old movie now. You know, we're yeah. coming up on 70 year, over 70 years of this film. But it's sort of a it's a classic and you can obviously see the, see the influence specifically recently on Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, this film, especially with Bounty Law. Obviously, there was a serial TV series that that was influenced by as well. But you can mm -hmm. see a lot of similarities between that and this movie. And this is one of the early archetypes for storytelling in the Western genre of, you know, a lone gunman protecting a town. Um, this is one of the early ones. And uh, this is this is a movie that really got me interested in Westerns. It was one of the first ones I saw because it was so highly regarded. I kept reading about it and then I watched it and I was like, it is really that good. And it's beautifully, beautifully photographed. It's one of two black and white films on this list. Um, it's just a sensational Western. It is perfect in the genre for what it is. It's really fantastic. All right, next up, at number 15, we have another contemporary film. Came out in, 19, in 2016 from director David McKenzie, Hell or High Water, written by Tyler Sheridan. This is a 7.6 on IMDb, a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, and an 88% on Metacritic. This is about two brothers, played by Chris Pine and Ben uh, Foster, who carry out a series of bank robberies in the local area to help pay for uh, the the home's insurance, as well as you know they come from poverty and they're trying to bring themselves up. And it's just fantastic. Great car chases, great shootouts. Ben Foster is phenomenal. Chris Pine is an incredible stoic lead. Great accents all around. Jeff Bridges is phenomenal, as he always is. It's really entertaining. It's got just, just some great suspense and thrills. A couple really cool long takes with the, with the bank robberies. 
and ultimately it culminated in one of my favorite scenes in a western which is it's just jeff bridges and chris pine for 10 minutes and it's just like two heavyweight actors going at it and it's just a really stunning beautiful scene that illustrates many of the themes carried out for the picture and what the whole point of the story was and i really love this film i think it's one of the better westerns of the century and it's a phenomenal movie and it really made tyler sheridan's career breaking him out in a big way this is one of those contemporary ones where it's cars replace horses and more modern guns replace revolvers, but it still works. It still has the same exact effect of a chase or, or running from the law, on the run, shootouts, everything, hanging out outside of a town, waiting for the bad guys to show up if you're Jeff Bridges. It's, it's pretty excellent. I, I really love this film, and a lot of people, you know, you see this online, people talk about this movie pretty often it's when, a they, beloved br- when one. they bring up westerns, especially this century. It's, it's up there for sure. It's, it's, I think it's going to age like, like fine wine. Just like Chris Pine. Just like Chris Pine. <laughs> and he's not listening. Let's move on to number 14 on our list, which clearly is an underrated film based off these critic scores. And I think just one of the most visually stunning movies of the century, shot brilliantly by Roger Deakins. We are talking about the assassination of Jesse James by the coward, by the coward Robert Ford. Came out in 2007, same year as 310 to Yuma. So there was like a little bit of a surge, surge of, yeah. of Westerns back then. Directed by Andrew Dominic. 7.5 on IMDb. That's pretty low for me. And it's a 77% great film. critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. Also a very low score. Incredible cast. I mean, we have Brad Pitt playing Jesse James. Casey Affleck as Robert Ford, which was one of the most sought-after roles for male actors in 2006, 2007 when they were casting it. He beat out pretty much every big actor at the time for that role. He was obviously Ben's brother, but he hadn't really established himself yet as a great actor. But this was the movie, I think, for Casey that really put him on the map in Hollywood being like, wow, an insanely talented guy. He's brilliant in this film. He really brilliant. is. Sam Rockwell, another early role for him before, right before he did Iron Man 2 when he became a household name, I would say. He was also in some other great films like Chokes, a really good movie, an early one for him. But Sam Rockwell is a guy that we were like, in Moon, obviously, when that came out in 2009, 2010. Yeah, so he, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind was his big uh, one Matchstick Men with mm-hmm. Nick Cage yeah, was a big Man one. Was huge, right? Yeah, that's a good movie. Yeah, but this Renner's in this too. Jeremy Renner, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we also have yeah Jeremy Renner, Sam Shepard, Nick Cave, who also did the music for this film. Garrett Dillahunt. It's just an excellent, excellent cast of so many great actors. Paul Schneider, and it's about the infamous and unpredictable Jesse James, nicknamed the fastest gun in the West. He plans his next big heist while he launches. Preemptive strikes against those looking to collect the reward the law has placed on his head. Jesse's newest recruit, played by Casey Affleck, is Roberts. And Charlie, Sam Rockwell, growing increasingly jealous of the outlaw, as well as they start to become anxious of him, especially Robert. He's afraid that Jesse might take him out at some point. It's one of the main plot points of the film. When they seek an opportunity to kill Jesse, they gun him down, but their actions backfire when Jesse's fame is elevated to near mythical status. And that's not a that's not a spoiler because the movie's called The Assassination of Jesse James. <laughs> so I did not just spoil the movie, so come after me if you want, but it's the fucking title of the movie. Everyone knows what happened to him. You know, it's kind of just one of those American not heroes, but names in American, especially the American West, that's just lived on in infamy, maybe the most well-known name from the American Wild West. And yeah, I mean, people traveled across the country to see his dead body. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think that this this film is exceptional. It's long, slow-paced at times. It's very meditative, but it's gorgeously shot. Some of the best cinematography Roger Deakins has ever done. You know, the silhouette shots on the train, using those really, really old cameras with old film stock, with mm-hmm. old lenses to capture these interesting images. I think that, you know, Deacons proved himself as an all-time cinematographer in this movie and so many more after this, but it's, it's a really gorgeous film. I, I love the assassination, of Jesse, yeah. the assassination of Jesse James. It's a stunning film all around, and I think that Dominic and he wanted, I think what he was doing with this film, which is why it's not as, you know, well-received as you might think it is, he kind of did, I think he wanted to approach the Western in a different way from the spaghetti Western and from the shootout heavy Western um, and so there's there's no none of that stylized action, you know. There's no shootouts. There's no like gunslinging. There's no um, Mexican standoff in this film. And so I think that the shootouts in this film they're quick and they're uh, realistic and they happen kind of chaotically. And there's really no planning to them at all. So I think he wanted to make a western that separated itself from what was often seeing and seen in the genre. And he accomplished that. 
Unfortunately, it was a failure at the box office on a budget of thirty million dollars. It only grossed fifteen globally. Wow! So it probably lost fifteen. Lost maybe twenty, thirty million dollars after you factor in marketing and movie theater cuts. Yeah. Maybe it's made its money back in since two thousand seven on rentals and merchandise. Who knows? Possibly, that, but it just didn't make money for the studio, unfortunately. And you know, even though it's a great film, it maybe was an, a palatable film for audiences. I think it's um probably a lack of audiences. action, yeah. lack of action, and none of his films make money. Andrew Dominic's. It's too bad. He's a really great director. He's a really fascinating director. He's visually incredible. All right, next up. We have our first Quentin Tarantino film. Oh, yeah. At number 13, we have The Hateful Eight, which is a 7.8 on IMDb, 75% on Rotten Tomatoes, and 68% on Metacritic. Came out Christmas Day, 2015. We were there. Yeah, we were. 70 millimeter, baby. Oh, yeah. At Arclight in Sherman Oaks. It's great. Uh, while racing toward the town of Red Rock in post-Civil War Wyoming, bounty hunter John the Hangman Ruth and his fugitive prisoner, encounter another bounty hunter and a man who claims to be sheriff hoping to find shelter from a blizzard the group travels to a stagecoach stopover located on a mountain pass greeted there by four strangers the eight travelers soon learn that they may not make it to their destination after all this film is just so much fun and it it really went back to tarantino went back to his bones of reservoir dogs of making a film basically set in one location and it's just those two films what a great double feature you know what I mean they're phenomenal and this is just he's operating on a grand scale great cinematography like always from Robert Richardson an incredible score from Ennio Morricone one of his best and he won an Oscar for fantastic characters to no surprise from a Tarantino film filled with a lot of twists and turns that you don't see coming this is a really entertaining watch it's an easy rewatch for me uh, even though it is a lengthy run time, run time it's extremely entertaining and i have an absolute blast it's gory it's bloody it's violent you never see anything like it in the genre before i just really adore the hateful eight and it's just littered with an amazing cast of actors i think it's one of the only tarantino movies we haven't covered in a solo episode we haven't it's uh, it's one of the ones that we haven't done maybe we'll i think we should it. probably do it this year and it would be an absolute banger an absolute banger let's fucking go man let's do it man let's it's do the it. thing as a Western. Yeah, it's great. Thing. In Reservoir Dogs. It's, it's absolutely amazing. We love The Hateful Eight. We know a lot of you do as well. But man, low low scores, especially on Rotten Tomatoes, 75%. 68 Metacritic? The disrespect. The disrespect on incredible filmmaking and screenwriting and acting. It, it's just a damn shame. And damn dude, shame. Robert Richardson just fucking crushed it. This movie's incredible. So good. Absolutely incredible. Like, how do you make a room full of people interesting to watch for three hours? He did it. Obviously, you leave the room here and there. Yeah, you know, yeah, here and there. Yeah, but like... 80% of the movie takes place inside the haberdashery. Yeah. Yeah. 80% of it, at least. Let's move on to number 12 on our list. We have another classic from 1969. Oh, my God. Is directed that by old? George Roy Hill. This will make you feel old, especially, well, I mean, we didn't grow up here. But, <laughs> but I watched it when we were kids. Yeah. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, starring the great legends themselves, Paul Newman as Butch Cassidy and Robert Redford as the Sundance Kid. 8.0 on IMDb, 89% Rotten Tomatoes score, 4.15, 4, 4, and, 4 and a half. 4.5. It says 1 slash 5. Oh, 4.2. 4.2 on, on Letterboxd. Letterbox. When you hit the space bar, it turns it into a fraction. Really? If you do yeah. like 4.2? Yeah. It's kind of annoying. Yeah. Now, this is the true story of these. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. Fast draws. <laughs> these two outlaws, right? Yes. They plan this this bank robbery, right? Yeah. Or train robbery, I'm sorry. A train heist. And it goes wrong. <laughs> and then they're on the run from a posse, another posse. They have their own posse, but another posse is hunting their heels. So they got to try to... It's a it's a on the run movie. It's a chase movie. What's great about it being a chase movie is it, it's a chase movie over like the entire West. Yeah, it's like and then they keep getting America. they keep like gate they, they they'll travel like a hundred miles. They'll get on a ridge. They'll be like, okay, we lost them. Then they'll look out in the distance and the posse's still still coming. Yeah, it's like this. It's the most amazing chase uh, that I've ever like because it's not like super active in the moment. It's more like how are we going to get away from these guys? We can't outrun them. They keep tracking us. They keep hunting us. They will not stop. It's kind of like the 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 villain posse is like a, a the terminator. Yeah. Like they can't outrun these guys. And it's just like the stakes of this movie from George Roy Hill, they just keep in, like compounding and compounding. And it's fantastic. And it also has a great opening scene of of Butch he goes to a bank to inquire about it. And he's, he's just, like, inspecting it, basically, for an upcoming robbery. And it shows 
how technology constantly changed uh, for security and safes and for uh, maintaining the, the bank's uh, wealth from robbers like them. And what it is, the reason why they go after the train is because the banks are too hard to rob now. He goes to the bank and he's like, there's no way we can get through this. It's too fortified. Technology is like, the, in a way, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid is a, a film about the end of the frontier, the end of the Wild West. And so what's happening is the gunslinger days are almost gone and the, the bank robbing ga- days are basically gone. There's no way they can rob these banks anymore. And so that's why they go after the train. And so it's a really it's a great film about the Western genre where it's uh, the transition into the Industrial Revolution and the end of the Wild West. As well as classic filmmaking techniques, which many Westerns have, especially matte paintings are mm-hmm. used in this movie. There's some great matte paintings that you were, you maybe don't pick up on right away uh, and some great stunts that Cliff Jump is really sensational. Yeah. And I, I really, really love this movie. It's great awesome, comedy, too. Yeah. It's really funny. One of the best lines in a Western is when Butch tells the Sundance, I've never actually shot anyone before. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> you picked a hell of a time to tell me. And it ends in an, um, one, of the ma- one of the best endings ever in a Western. And also, just two of the biggest stars ever yeah. being on the same screen together Similar to when we had Brad Pitt and Leo in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that was massive for our generation. But this was like the comparable star-studded cast of two of the biggest stars in Hollywood together on the same screen together as co-leads, basically. This was as exciting for for them as it was for us. And then they made The Sting next. Yeah. And won Best Picture. Hell yeah. Wow. What a, what a picture. All right, next up. At number 11, we have... One of the great films of all time, John Ford's The Searchers. 7.8 on IMDb and a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes, 3.9 on Letterboxd. In this Western, John Wayne plays Ethan Edwards, who returns home to Texas after the Civil War. When members of his brother's family are killed or abducted by Comanches, he vows to track down his surviving relatives and bring them home, uh, most notably his niece by the end of the film. Eventually, Edwards gets word that his niece is alive, and along with her adopted brother, Martin Polly. He embarks on a dangerous mission to find her, journeying deep into Comanche territory. Uh, this is the best film that John Wayne and John Ford made together. Uh, their collaborations began with Stagecoach in like 38, 39, which is a big movie that of that day, black and white. But most of that film was shot with rear projection and, and backdrops, whereas now they're shooting act- in actual locations. And John Ford, especially with The Searchers and a couple of his other films around this time, really um, compounded and created the language of the Western uh, most notably, se- sequences like the image photography of Death Valley. Like, that's John Ford did that. He started that. Also, the famous shot that you've seen a thousand times of uh, inside of a house, the door opens and the interior is black because from light, and then the door is like a, a lit fra- flame outside, and someone walks outside. Like, he did that shot first, and it's in The Searchers where um, one of the actresses walks, she opens the door and walks outside. And you've seen that shot copied time and time again in every uh, in many westerns and just many films in general so uh things like that and how he photographed the desert uh, how he portrayed um outlaws how he portrayed um characters like this they became archetypes visually and storytelling wise for writing in the genre and the searchers is just an incredible film uh it's a great has a great conclusion great battles a really controversial ending uh, which i think is just it 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 begs for a good conversation and i think that's the reason why his ratings are a little bit low like a 3.9 on letterbox and a 7.8 on imdb they should be higher but it does have an ending that people question but you're talking about a character who's not a straight up hero and that's what this story is about it's, it's not about the heroic figure it's about you know a person who's more in the gray area and he means well but are his intentions well defined not really but it's an incredible film great story and just one of the most beautiful films ever shot and also if you saw the fablemans recently spielberg yeah. had a great cameo with david lynch's john ford <laughs> talking about the horizon when the horizon's on the top it's, it's interesting. interesting when the horizon's on the bottom it's interesting when the horizon's in the middle it's boring as shit <laughs> get the fuck out <laughs> what do you see <laughs> no what do you see <laughs> that's so funny it's one of the best parts of that movie <laughs> one of the best parts of that movie is David Lynch's John Ford. Really great stuff. Let's do one more film. 
and then we'll get to our intermission. Wait, no, we should do our intermission right now. Yeah, we're at 10. Yeah, we're, we're at 10. So let's take a break, go, go to our intermission, and we'll go back to the rest of our best Westerns of all time. And before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why would you want to do such a thing, Anthony? Why? 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 <laughs> because you get awesome perks. Is that what cowboys do? They scream, why? <laughs> yeah. I why? It. I invented it. Why would you want to? Because you get perks like merchandise, access to our Discord, private messages, video messages. You get watch party access. You get private custom episodes. All sorts of things if you sign up on Patreon. Also, access to the ad-free version of every episode. So, you don't have to listen to ads. Y'all understand why we have to put ads in the show. We have to pay the bill. We have to get Anthony his Trader Joe's. We have to get Juno his cat food. That's why we have to put ads in the show. But if you're a patron, you have access to the ad free version of every single episode plus bonus episodes. What? Bonus, bonus, bonus. <laughs> bonus episodes every week. <laughs> you're going to wear this hat more often. I just really get in character when I wear this hat. <laughs> and also, another great way to support the show is to leave those five star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. At 5,000 ratings on Apple, I will get a tattoo of Anthony's choosing somewhere on my body. Hopefully, not too embarrassing. So get those mm-hmm. ratings up. We gotta get those numbers up, everybody. Five thousand. Gotta get the out of we those rookie numbers. We got quite a few to go. Also, another great way to support the show is to just share us with your family and friends. Word of mouth is the absolute best way for a podcast to grow. It's so helpful. So share us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, wherever. Talk about us. Send us to your grandma. Send us to everyone in your phone contacts. Send us to Nana. Just send us to everyone, and that's how we'll grow and become the biggest show in the world. This episode, of course, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They are doing a movie poster giveaway in this episode. So if you want to win a free movie poster from MoviePosters.com, all you got to do is make a comment in our Best 20 Westerns of All Time episode on YouTube. Make that comment in that video, and that enters you into the contest. We're going to pick a winner next week. For a free movie poster from MoviePosters.com. In the meantime, they have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. These are high-quality prints, super affordable, all sorts of options. There's no better place to get your posters online today. So be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com right now. Let's get into our intermission, Anthony. Are you ready? Ready. Here's the quote. Now, it's not super hard, so just give people a chance to guess it, though, Anthony. So now you come in firing hot. If you know it, you guess right away, too. Nuh-uh. Don't, don't, don't hit so, me with that. Lie. Here we go. So that was Mrs. Lundergaard on the floor there, huh? <laughs> and I guess that was your accomplice in the wood chipper and those three people in Brainerd. And for what? For a little bit of money. There's more to life than a little money, you know. Don't you know that? And here you are. And it's a beautiful day. Well... I just don't understand it. <laughs> Would you like me to wait? I think it's, it's sufficient time has passed. Should, no, should I wait more? Actually, yeah, wait. Yeah? Should Keep I, waiting. Like, how, when will you be comfortable for me to answer? Right now. No, I'll wait a little bit more. No, no, right now no, no, it's no, fine. I'll wait a little now, bit more. Into the phone. It's Fargo. It's what? Fargo. Fargo. Fargo, Fargo fuck, fuck yourself. yourself. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> All right, here's my quote. Curly, tough ain't enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good impression. Tough ain't enough. That's not Batman. <laughs> Hit the bag harder. Magushla. Magushla. Magushla means my love. My kin. Oh, man, I'm going to cry now. Million Dollar Baby. Great guess, man. Thanks. That's correct. Thanks. I love that film. Let's move on to the movie release here, Anthony. What year did The Lost Boys come out? 1986. One off. 1987. Oh, 87. I'm really not looking forward to the remake. It's going to be a bunch of fuckboys. A bunch of fuckboys. If they make it set in the 80s, it might be cool. They're not going to. No. Gonna be, no, it's not going to be set in the 80s. If they did, that'd be cool. Yeah, but it is what it is, man. It is what it is. They're going to ruin it. I know they will. We'll see. I love this film. All right. What year did Escape from Alcatraz come out? Oh, I love Alcatraz. How much do you love I it? I love this movie. How much do you love it? 
no, no. 1972. 79. Oh, my God, it's that. You weren't even near it. Yeah, 1979. Holy crap. Oh, Clint's pretty old in it. Yeah. It's pretty old. He's like middle-aged in it. Yeah. God damn it. Guess you don't like that movie. I guess so. I guess Poser. so. Poser. Fake fan. All right, Anthony. Let's head to the pop quiz. One musical has won best picture this century. What was it? And bonus points if you can guess the year. Chicago. <laughs> In 2004. 2002. Mm. Damn. Nice old. job. Nice job. Directed by Rob Marshall. I didn't ask that. Sorry, Nicole Kidman, Renee Zellweger, and Richard Gere. I never asked any of that. <laughs> Didn't ask any of that information. Well, so happened. now I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> We've all become dumber. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I call that guy. <laughs> How many films has Clint Eastwood directed? Fuck. 38. 39. You're, oh! very, you're very close. That was close. <laughs> that was close. He's directed 39 films. Many of the films he starred in, he directed. Does that include the new one? Not included. His final film? Yeah. He hasn't directed it yet. He's directing it. That's why I asked. Yeah. So he'll, he'll be number 40. Wow. Going out at 40 movies directed. That's crazy. It's a lot of fucking movies. A lot of movies. 39. It's crazy. All right, Anthony. Do we have any haters this week? Any unsubscribes? Oh, yeah. Um, just stall for a second while I gather them. <laughs> stall for a second because Anthony's always unprepared. Well, I'm well, the guy who I'm, does his job. I'm you always must be prepared. the other guy. This is the first time. Do we have a camera in the back? Please tell me we have a camera in the back. It's not fucking NASA. <laughs> Departed. We always end up calling The Departed. Well, it's a great movie. It is a great movie. Well, while you do that, I can pull up a five-star rating and review. I got him. I got him. I got him. Okay. Well, now it's too late. Just do it. Just do it. Do it. Wait, wait. Do it. Thomas Patrick Watson, who's a stuntman, uh, wrote, Listen today in your review of your with your review, review of The Fall Guy, and now I'm even more hyped for it, which as a stuntman wasn't sure I would be able to get much more hyped for, but you've done it. Still stand by the fact that you boys should do a stunt episode. Yeah, I think we should, I was talking about this. Or I may just unsubscribe. We should do a stunt episode. Well, we've, we've done a Jackie Chan episode where we did his best stunts, so that's yeah. one I recommend checking out. But we should do an all-time best stunts. And yeah. Again, stunt people or anyone who works in the film industry or has been on sets, The Fall Guy is a movie you're going to love, not just for stunt people because it's so accurate with what set life is like. But Tom actually flew out to California a month and a half ago and helped us work on some previs stuff. So Tom's a great guy. He's been a huge fan of the show. He's an awesome stunt guy. Flew him around like a, like in the air like crazy. We flew him like, <laughs> like 20 feet in the air. It was so cool. <laughs> it was a blast working with Tom. He's a great guy. But um, he's a madman. He's he's super athletic. And thanks so much, Tom, for being such a huge fan. And Tom P. R. Watson on Instagram. Tom, you gotta wa- you're gonna love the Fall Guy, man. You're gonna absolutely love the Fall Guy. <laughs> Next up, Travis Gilroy wrote, "Y'all care so much about stump people that you can't name who won an award at the BAFTAs." Unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch the. I haven't watched the BAFTAs ever. <laughs> I've never ever watched it. It was all me. It was it's, all me. Yeah, Anthony wa- actually watched it. You say Wolfgang Pearson made Amadeus. I'm still getting this one. You're still getting it, man. I'm getting this one from Danny Smith. Unsubscribed. <laughs> Worst mistake of my life. It is. <laughs> All right. Jen Mania wrote, holy fuck, you guys change. You change your testimony, not your evidence. Unsubscribe. We said that in an episode. What episode was it? I can't recall, but she got us. Got him. Got us. Got him. And then we have. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, Jose McCade, McDade wrote, "Drink a shot every time they say is a film. A film is the greatest of all time." That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you can't be saying that every episode, Anthony. <laughs> How can many films be the greatest? Unsubscribe. That's why I make fun of Anthony now. It's my new favorite thing because he says one of the best performances of the century, one of the best movies ever. Yeah, but I never say the best. Still better than saying no, the best. You've done it for. You've done that for Cape Blanchett and Tar. And then you did it last week. No, no, but I, I, I still never say for something Stone. is the best. I still never say something you is said the greatest. One hundred percent, the best movie of all time is. I'm Universal careful. Soldier. I carefully say I one you, of. You said it about Universal Soldier. I'm very careful. I'm always. I always say one of the best. I never say this is the best. I think maybe your brain thinks you say one of the best. No. You said it for mm. Kate. Then you said it for Emma. What did I say? The best performance of the century. No, I didn't. I said it's, it's one. You've of the also best. said it for Natalie Portman. For, I've, for I've, Black said, Swan. I've said one of the best. Those I've never three. said. Oh, I've never said it's yes, the best. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. That's why people are commenting it. 
No, he's saying because I said it so many times how can be. I never no in that episode I never said something was the greatest. I said I kept saying they're one of the greatest. That's the difference I'm saying. That's the difference I'm saying. We need some people to back me up on this. That Anthony has said the best for Natalie Portman, Kate Blanchett, and Emma Stone now for their performance of the century. <laughs> I said Emma's Confirmed. performance is one of the best of the last five years and one of the best of the century. I did not you, say you it was the best. I edited that. I episode. did not say it was the best. Find me the I clip. Did not, I, I'll pull it up for you. <laughs> find me the clip. Where, I fucking find edited. Me, I, find, I, Find me the clip where I said Emma Stone in Poor Things is the best performance. Okay. The best. Sure. Okay. Easy peasy. <laughs> I will do it after we record. I can't wait for this. I fucking edited the episode. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see about that. All right. Anyways. <laughs> whoa, uh, whoa. Uh. Oh, I'm sorry. I cut out this guy's t- uh, name. Having having something as mid as District 9 on this list and not having the sci-fi anime classic Akira. Instead, guys, I can't believe it unsubscribed. Sorry, pal. We, we carry. We, we didn't put did a, live action though. Yeah, we, we carry. Carry. Yeah, but if we start going to animated, then it would have been a lot. There would have been a yeah. lot. So we just stuck to live action. Yeah. Sorry, pal. Sorry, bud. Next up, Batman who laughs. No Star Wars unsubscribed. <laughs> and then Bev wrote, "No primer, no coherence, unsubscribed." <laughs> no, a great list. And I must admit, you gave yourself such a hard job cutting it down to only thirty films. Yeah, it was tough. Originally, we were going to do twenty, then we we're like, we can't do twenty. Yeah, How twenty we was to do the impossible. Best twenty sci-fi films of all time. Twenty was in fucking possible. And then our last one is Miguel, who wrote, "The show is better than ever, kids. You guys are on fire. Woo! I've been listening to the Twins for holy shit, almost two fucking years, four fucking years." But boy, slightly disappointed. No mention of the gold I'm handing you. Denis tried to sneak in. A French Canadian swear in Dune Part Two, Tabernac, which is a swear word in, in French Canadian. Oh no way! Uh, brings the legend back to just one of us trying to make his people his and his make his people laugh. Honestly, might have to unsubscribe. Give an OG listener a shout out. What's up, Miguel? OG. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, pal. All right, let's move on to a great fun fact too. That's that, a cool I fact. Didn't know that. Which part of the movie is that in? I don't know. I'll have to I'll have to look it up. Tabernac. Tabernac. I'm trying to think. I've only seen it twice. I plan on seeing it hopefully next week in IMAX again. You uh, better. I've only seen it twice. I want to see it again in theaters for sure. Yeah. We should go to the Universal IMAX. And I want to see it, it in IMAX again. Yeah, I want to do the City Walk. Oh, yeah. City Walk, Universal IMAX. City Walk. Oh, guy. my God. What a theater. What a what picture. What a picture. We have a great five star rating and review on Apple from Guy Man 1433. What's a Guy Man? He wrote, Yes. Watch it, please. These guys are actually the best podcasters out there. It's so cool to see these guys actually care about all this stuff. I've been a listener since early 2021. Wow. Wowzers. And I couldn't be happier. I started following them. I first saw them by looking up movie podcasts and didn't think it was for me. But after a while, I figured that I might as well try it out. And it's the best decision I've ever made. Aww. I can't recommend this show enough as it got me through a really dark part of my life. and always has been there for me. Thank you guys so much. Prayer emojis from Evan King TK. By the way, I'm unsubscribed. Oh, what's up, pal? Oh, thanks, long time listener, always interacting with us. Appreciate it, Evan. You're the best. That's that's You're a really sweet message. Really love that review. He's also he always changes his letterbox top for color palette in very cool ways. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> baller. Um, appreciate the review and leaving the written ones are so fun to read out. And again, at five thousand Apple podcast ratings. Get a tattoo, baby. So get let's get tat- those numbers up, everybody. Tat it up. You don't need an iPhone to leave an Apple rating. You don't. You don't. You could do it with the Game Boy. All you need is an email no, address. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can do it with the Game yeah, Boy. Yeah, you can't do, do it Game with Game Boys Boy. have internet connection? Maybe nowadays. Do they still make Game Boys? No, because like Nintendo DS has just taken over. over. Yeah. yeah. I doubt it. I doubt <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, Bernie and Phil. <laughs> What's your streaming recommendation for this episode, Anthony? The Man with No Name Trilogy is on Max. Go watch them all. I watched the trilogy in the last couple of weeks. It's great. Although I watched it out of order. I watched The Good, Bad, The Ugly, then uh, A Fistful of Dollars, then a, for a few dollars more. Cool. So I did three, one, two. My streaming recommendation is Aaron Brockovich, which is on Netflix. A great crime mystery. Very entertaining. Julia Roberts is terrific in this movie. It's more of an investigation. Yeah, but it's still a mystery and a yeah. crime. Yeah, but crime mystery makes it seem like she's like a cop. It's, she's investigating a crime. Yeah. Is there a massive crime taking place? It's not a mystery, really. There's it's, a mystery. It's more of like how does she? How yeah, are these people? No, I'm, the mystery is why. How are these people getting sick? I'm just saying, like the mis- you, crime mystery makes it seem like it's like a hunting a serial killer or something. She's hunting a corporation that's doing terrible <laughs> things because all these people keep getting sick in the specific area. It's a mystery. Why are they getting sick? 
Okay. All right. It's a mystery. Thanks. It's a mystery. You're right. I would describe it as a <laughs> yeah, mystery. I don't th- know thank you. That. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's a crime a, investigation thank film. Thank you. You motherfucker. It's a lawyer movie. You motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Disagreeing with me just to do it. <laughs> That's why people listen, man. You know Crime Mystery was no way to build that movie. <laughs> there is a mystery in it, though. Shut up. Just get out of here. It's probably the get best Get out of way. town, it's man. the best way to describe the movie. Get out of here. It's a dark mystery. <laughs> it's a movie about paperwork, honestly. And also, what's his name? Harvey Dent. Aaron Eckhart. Aaron Eckhart has a, a great mustache in that movie. Yeah, he plays a biker in a biker gang. It's Albert Finney. Gang. Albert Finney plays Julie Roberts' boss. He's, yeah. he's great. They're it's great not together. A, it's not a gang. Biker gang. He's just, he's just like a, a gearhead. No, he's with a bunch of bikers. They they drive around the country. Eh, I wouldn't say he's like a gang though. It's like a. <laughs> I'm not saying it's like a drug dealing gang. He's it's just, just a gang next, of bikers. He's just the neighbor. No, 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 no. He's not the neighbor. <laughs> you, did you watch the movie? <laughs> Yeah. He leaves his biker gang to live with her. He lives next door. No, they were just stopping by. He lives next door. They were just stopping by. He lives his next biker door. crew was just stopping by. He lives next door. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let's see. Pretty sure that his character lives next door. And he starts to babysit the kid. The kids. No, he lives there. They were just passing through. He's like working on his bike in the garage and everything. So, Aaron Brockovich, the film. I don't blah, think blah, you're blah, find blah, the specific blah, detail. Blah 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 blah. Let's see. Aaron <laughs> James is gonna Aaron's, say some bullshit. <laughs> He's about to say some bullshit. Aaron's neighbor, <laughs> played by Aaron Hackhart, who's been living next door for 17 years, <laughs> long term, <laughs> falls for Aaron. It starts to babysit her kids. <laughs> it's here, man. Wow, 17 years, man. He lived it's there here, for man. a long time. Long, long fucking time. <laughs> he's actually a landlord, right? He's a re- no, he's not a landlord. He's just a neighbor, Anthony, like I said. 17-year <laughs> neighbor. All right, let's move on. Let's get back <laughs> to the episode. His name is George. Okay. Take it Biker away, boyfriend. Take, take it away with number 10. Number 10 on our list of <laughs> the best Westerns of all time. Not Aaron Brockovich, but we have Tombstone, directed by George Cosmatos and Kevin Jair. Came back, came out all the way back in 1993, on Christmas Day, one of the most stylish westerns, and one of the coolest westerns because of the characters. I mean, we have Wyatt Earp, played by Kurt Russell, Morgan, Bill Paxton, Virgil, Sam Elliott, but also Doc Holliday, the sick and dying Doc Holloway, sweating all over the floor, <laughs> played by Val Kilmer. <laughs> you see, I don't think I've ever seen a character sweat so much so in my much life. So sweat. So much sweat, so pale. <laughs> <laughs> so Wyatt Earp, his brothers, Morgan and Bill, Morgan and, and Virgil, they've left their gunslinger ways behind them. And they settled down in a small town and started a business in a town of Tombstone, Arizona. Well, they aren't looking to find trouble. Trouble soon finds them. When they become the targets of, of, Ruth, of a ruthless cowboy gang, now together with Wyatt's best friend, the dying and sweating Doc Holliday... <laughs> The brothers pick up their guns once more to restore order in this lawless land. I'm your Huckleberry. Great movie. Great movie. Great mustaches. Great lines. Great, great mustaches. Excellent mustaches. Kurt Russell is just mustache goals. Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott, too. But, yeah, it's a great cast. It's everything you want in a Western. Shootouts. Great cinematography. Sweat. 50% run on Metacritic is just super low. That's absurd. IMDb, it's a 7.8. Ron Tomatoes is a 73%. I think those deserve to be higher because it's an, it's a classic. Uh, one of our older brothers loved this movie. He had a poster of it in his bedroom. Mm-hmm. But it, it's a banger of all. T- it's an all time banger for Tombstone's the Western genre. Tombstone's great. Tombstone's great. Okay, next up, at number nine, we have another Sergio Leone film, which came out in 1967, the second film in the trilogy for a few dollars more. Uh, this is an 8.2 on IMDb, a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 74% on Metacritic. In the Wild West, a murderous outlaw known as El Indio and his gang are terrorizing and robbing the citizens of the region of the region with the plan to rob the El Paso Bank. Meanwhile, two bounty hunters, played by Clint and Cleef, um, they band together to be like, we can get the money from the bad guys when they steal it from the bank. So they team up. But things don't go according to plan. This is phenomenal. I actually just watched it the other night uh, to finish out, round out the trilogy. What's cool about the trilogy is all the stories are unrelated. It's really just Clint's the only constant throughout. 
And Lee, Van, Lee Van Cleef plays the villain in Good, Bad, the Ugly, but he plays uh, a friend in this one. Different characters. So I like how Sergio was just like, fuck it. Let's just cast him again in Good, <laughs> the Bad, the Ugly. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so it's, the stories are unrelated. But it is essentially, it's like a trilogy of films, which is really cool. And like I said earlier, where he, Leone and his DP, and Ennio Morricone, they were figuring out the code of the Western. This film, they got so close. I gave it a five out of, five star rating on Letterbox. It's that good, and it has an incredible villain in Indio, played by Gian Maria Val- Valonte, who's fantastic as just this ruthless killer, uh, terrible antagonist, and just a guy that you just like you want to see lose. You see, they did a great job, and he phenomenal performance by him as like as a villain. It's just re- remarkable. But the so the music and the cinematography. In the story, it's like they're just so close to good and the bad, bad and the ugly. Like the shots are just like they're almost there. And then the music is just like Ennio's themes. It's like they're sensational, but they're not. It's like he almost he's all he's so close to making the perfect theme. You know what I mean? And the DP and Sergio, they're so close to capturing the perfect frames and telling the perfect sto- story. And there's like there's just like almost there. And they're so close that it's still a five star movie. So even though Good, Bad, and the Ugly is a five, and this one's a less is an inferior film, it's yes. still a five for you. Yeah, absolutely, still an all time western. Yeah, it's that good, and it, but it's just like, I mean, there's five star movies that are great movies, and there's five star movies that are some of the greatest ever made. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This this that that's the example. You know what I mean? It's just like they're both five stars, but they just like they were like the hints of. Good and Bad and the Ugly are in this movie, especially in the music. Like, any of his themes, they're like, it's like he's almost, he almost found the the theme for Good and Bad and the Ugly. He almost got it in this one. It's just so entertaining, too. But this one, it has just like a great, great villain and antagonist. And it's it's a cool bank robbery sequence. It's just so much fun, um, which I really loved. Um, this is a fantastic film, beautiful cinematography, really great night photography for the time. Uh, for a few dollars more, excellent film. Number nine. Number nine. Well, <clears throat> I think we can assume that the third film is going to be on this list at some point. Maybe. Maybe. It's possible. Now, let's get into a Best Picture winner here, right? Yes, sir. At number eight on our list. Yeah, seven Oscars for this film, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Cinematography, Best Sound, Best Editing, Best Original Score. In 1990... Kevin Costner made Dances with Wolves, which I actually sat down and watched for the first time. Was it two years ago? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, we went with uh, our mother and our aunt. We got a house. Mm-hmm. Where's the, where were we? Cupertino? Carmel by the Sea? Carmel. Carmel in California, just north of LA. And we were just like, we had a day and we were like, hey, what should we do today? Uh, kind of tired. We've been doing a lot of touristy stuff. Let's just chill and watch a movie. And we put on Dances with Wolves, Dances with Wolves, which is a pretty long film. It's over three hours. And just by one minute, though, it's an 8, 0, 8.0 on IMDb, 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. Letterboxd is 3.8. Jeez, that's low. And this movie's sensational. It is so well made. Some incredible stunt work that I'm still, when I saw it for the first time, I was flabbergasted. The bison hunt. The bison hunt is incredible. It's captured it all on camera. It's all real. And I got to say, I've seen this movie twice. That was my second time watching it. And that sequence is just one of the most incredible sequences I've ever seen. Sequences of action I've ever seen in a film. It's unbelievable. The horse riding in general is stellar in this film. I've mm-hmm. never seen it captured so vividly. It's absolutely incredible. And and uh, Kevin Costner plays a Civil War soldier who's been who develops a relationship with a band of Lakota Indians after he's been deployed to sort of stand guard at yeah. this like shack for months at a time and with nothing happening really. He's just got like a storage of some munitions. To yeah. hold, he has to watch them, and he's he becomes attracted and and just really forms a kinship engaged in, yeah. with the lifestyle of the Lakota Indians, and he chooses to leave his former life behind to be with them, having observed them. They gave him the name Dances with Wolves because he's very fearless. He's a great fighter as well as a very loyal person. Soon. He's welcomed as a member of the tribe and falls in love with a white woman who has been raised by the tribe since she was a young girl. Tragedy results when Union soldiers arrive with designs on the land to take it over. It's incredible. 
but it also deals with the elements of displacement for sure, you know, in, in the effects of colonization on the indigenous tribes of North America. And I think it does so with great nuance and respect for the cultures. Obviously, a lot of people will come after this film for, you know, the typical white savior movie. But at the same time, it, it respects the culture so much. And it's a Hollywood film. I mean, it's kind of just the, the formula, especially for this time. You know, uh, Last of the Mohicans, similar kind of controversy, you could say. You know, these movies don't really get, can't get made anymore because of that. But again, what's always, what's always confused is they have people who are critical of it probably haven't seen the films. Yeah, because exactly. Because none of the films, they aren't white savior movies. They are about, you know, a member of the white community who joins this other tribe, this tribe, this other community yeah. out of love and respect and admiration. And it's, they're not saving anyone, but they've become a member uh, and a warrior within the tribe. Last Samurai, same thing. Uh, and there's a reason why people call... They'll, they'll call movies like Avatar Dancing with Wolves in Space or Last Samurai Dancing with Wolves with Samurai because this was the first major one and it's it's done so well and with a lot of respect, like you said, and reverence for the community and for the cultures. And it's, it's well respected and regarded by uh, the, the cultures and communities and tribes that were involved in the production of the film. And from what I've read and seen, uh, they were very happy with the film. So that's to me, that's at the end of the day, that's what really matters. I concur. Yeah. Next up, great film by the way. So good. It's so good. It gets a lot good. of flack, but it's great. So goddamn good. It's great. Although it beat Goodfellas. True. That's the one it it, it won over. It's a more Hollywood film. Yeah. It's a more Oscar worthy yeah. film. Well, Oscar-y film. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up at number seven, we have a film directed by Ang Lee, which came out in two thousand and five, Brokeback Mountain. Which is a uh, 7.7 on IMDb, quite low, 88% around tomatoes, and 87% on Metacritic. In 1963, rodeo cowboy Jack Twist and ranch hand Ennis Del Mar are hired by a rancher named Joe Aguirre as sheep herders in Wyoming. One night in Brokeback Mountain, Jack makes a drunken pass at Ennis, who is that is eventually reciprocated. Uh, this is just an incredible tragedy, and a beautiful, stunning film. Um, it's it's unbelievable to show how skilled of a director Ang Lee is coming from a completely different world and a completely different background and a completely different language and making this film. It's so impressive. His range as a storyteller is just, uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, he really is one of the greats, um, especially in Asian history. Uh, and Brokeback Mountain is a phenomenal film uh, with great co-stars, uh, Anne Hathaway, Linda Cardinelli, Linda Cardinelli are also phenomenal. Um, ultimately, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Heath Ledger, it's their chemistry, it's their camaraderie, it's their brotherhood they formed. Um, the acting is incredible. It's just unbelievable to behold. A really powerful story. Uh, it's emotional. It's stunning. It's it's bold. Um, it's deeply, deeply affecting and moving. Uh, this is a movie that it makes me weep every time I see it. Uh, it's got a wonderful score. A beautiful, beautiful score. Guess who did it? This was... Wasn't Marco no. Gustavo? Gustavo, Santa right? Yeah. yeah, Gustavo from uh, The Last of Us. Um, incredible guitar uh, and notes, and the themes are just stunning. And uh, this is a movie that breaks you; it really does. And it's it's really tough to watch because of how 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 tragic it is, but it's also extremely beautiful. You left out Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams, great. Michelle Williams, yeah, yeah, she's, she's great. Terrific. Sorry, Michelle Williams, Ang Lee amazing. Won best director for this film, deservedly so. It was one of the best movies of the year, but it's so well crafted, as well as his great use of visual effects that are it's seamless in this film. Mm -hmm. You know, a majority of the sheep and animals in this movie are are visual effects. They've been inserted, and then same thing with the mountains and the great landscapes. A lot of them are natural, but they enhanced a lot of the landscapes as well with forests and ridge lines and mountains. But it's Sensational film. We did an incredible episode on this movie yeah. like a year and a half ago. It's, it's one of my favorites of the century. Yeah, it, it's up there. It's, it's one of the best movies of all time, I think. It's absolutely terrific. But kind of low scores, 88% on Rotten Tomatoes, 7.7 .7 on IMDb, 87% Metacritic. Maybe a movie ahead of its time. I feel like this movie, if it came out today, would have swept everything at the Academy Awards. Yeah. Um, and I guess it just was – it was early for, you know, acceptance a lot uh, – acceptance – um, and I think that it just kind of opened the world up to different kinds of stories than we usually get. Yeah, it's a 4.1 on Letterboxd, which is great, but I, I do think it should be a little higher. 
It's that. It's just a remarkable film. It really is. It truly is. It truly is. Let's move into number six in our list. We have another Best Picture winner. Man, Westerns winning Best Pictures are great. This We're getting into really good ones. This one won Best Picture when it came out in 1992. Unforgiven, directed by Clint Eastwood, who also won Best Director for this film and also won Best Editing and a Best Supporting Role for Gene Hackman. 88.2 on IMDb, 96% Rotten Tomatoes, 85% on Metacritic. Sensational film. Clint Eastwood, one of his best movies he's ever made and acted in as well, too. He plays a former outlaw, former bandit, who gets involved with this local town after this new lawman comes to town, English Bob, I mean, not English Bob, um, Little Bill, played by Gene Hackman. He's the new sheriff. English Bob is a pretty cool name. But English Bob, played by Richard Harris, is an outlaw who's come to, he's been arrested, he, there's a bounty on his head. And Clint Eastwood... And his friend, played by Morgan Freeman, get involved in this local town when a prostitute is disfigured by a pair of cowboys, and Little Bill doesn't really do anything about it. And this forces Clint Eastwood to kind of come out of retirement after the prostitutes of the town, the sex workers at the brothel, Ned gets killed. And then he's, I'm going back into full outlaw bandit mode. I'm getting vengeance, my friends. So it's a great film, great storytelling, a vengeance tale, great characters. I mean, English Bob... A great character. Little Bill's a great character. William Money. So it's it's just the pinnacle of filmmaking. You and, know what I mean? I mean Unforgiven is terrific. These veteran actors, Gene Hackman, Richard Harris, Morgan Freeman, and Clean Eastwood, like, oh my God, what a cast. What a great cast. So it's phenomenal. And so, it's got so good. it's got one of the most badass scenes ever in film. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. It's one of the coolest scenes, the most badass moments in history. Oh my god, in this movie. I don't want to spoil it. But if you want to see a bad motherfucker, watch Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven. It's incredible. Fucking A, man. All right. We're in the top five now. Big time. This is a this is a good five set of films. I'm not sure if you took a peek, but these are, these are great films. I sure did, films. man. I sure did. Would you like to take it away with uh, our next number five? Let's do it. We have at number five on the best westerns of all time another Quentin Tarantino film. We have Django Unchained. Came out in 2012. Now that's going to make you feel old, I'm sure. It does. It does. 8.5 on IMDb, 87% Rotten Tomatoes, 4.6 on Letterboxd. Nice math. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. What a sensational film and just one of the most entertaining of his entire career. Django Unchained, starring Jamie Foxx, Christoph Waltz, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kerry Washington, Samuel L. Jackson, Walton Goggins. Don Johnson, this cast is absolutely absurd. Even a cameo from Jonah Hill. Two years before the Civil War, Django, a slave, finds himself accompanying an unorthodox German bounty hunter named Dr. King Schultz on a mission to capture the vicious Brittle Brothers who worked on a plantation that Django worked on in his youth. And he's the only one who can identify the Brittle Brothers for King Schultz. Their mission successful, Schultz frees Django, and together they hunt the South's most wanted criminals. Their travels take them to the infamous plantation of Shady Calvin Candy, where Django's long-lost wife, played by Carrie Washington, Brumhilda, is still a slave as they try to get her freedom from the plantation and from Calvin Candy, one of the best roles that Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio has ever done. This movie's incredible. It's engaging, entertaining, Brilliantly shot. One of Tarantino's best-looking movies. The music slaps. Great soundtrack. Great original score at times as well. But man, just the stunts are awesome. The the gunfights are awesome. Django is a character that you root for constantly. You're constantly rooting for Django. He's like Superman in this movie. And I love this film. It's so well made. So well crafted. It's funny. It's heartbreaking. Tragic. But my God, it's entertaining. It's entertaining fantastic. as hell. Yeah. It's one of his best, and I think it deserves all those high ratings. It's really phenomenal. And it, it's one of the most visually beautiful westerns ever made. It really is. Django! Robert, R Bob Richardson, man. Bob Richardson. Doesn't get much uh, attention, but he, deser he deserves it. He's an all-timer. All right, next up at number four, we have the oldest film on this list. All the way back in 1948. This movie's almost 80 years old. We have... John Huston's The Treasure 
of the Sierra Madre, which he also wrote. This is an 8.2 on IMDb, 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 4.6 on Letterboxd. This film stars Humphrey Bogart in his best acting performance of, of his career. In this classic adventure film, two rough-and-tumble wanderers, Dobbs and Curtin, meet up with a veteran prospector, Howard, in Mexico and head into the Sierra Madre Mountains to find gold. Although they discover treasure, they also find plenty of trouble, not only from ruthless bandits lurking in the dangerous Mexican wilderness, but from their own insecurities and greed, which threaten to bring conflict at any moment. This is a black-and-white film, really stunning cinematography. It's a beautiful, beautiful film. Terrific performances, but it's the screenplay. This is one of the best screenplays on this list, and it's just brilliant. It showcases the dark facets of humanity and how, at the end of the day, when put in certain situations, everybody's in it for themselves and self-preservation. Betrayal, trust, um, it's really phenomenal. And Humphrey Bogart plays Dobbs. Him and Curtin, um, after they're, they're broke, they're penniless, they have they don't know what they're doing, but uh, they have an interest in digging for gold. And they come into a little bit of money, so they're able to hire a veteran prospector who has experience digging for gold. He takes them out into the mountains in Mexico. And they actually, they find a shit ton of gold. They spend weeks digging it all out. They, ha- they build up a whole infrastructure, a whole system, pulley systems. Like, they're, they're, they're crushing it. They're, they're gathering gold and gold and gold every day. Um, and the gold is powder that they have to sift through. It's not like chunks of gold. It's like really like powder. And as they gather more gold, their trust in each other begins dwindling until eventually the three of them, they're like, they are, they start dividing the gold every time they get it each day, and then they all three of them have their own private hiding spots nearby, so that none of the other the other men can uh, know where their gold is, and that just starts the power plays and the dynamics of uh, lack of trust and betrayal until you don't know who to trust or what to do, and and it just culminates in a really fantastic third act, uh, the treasure of Sierra Madre. If you haven't seen it, it's one of the one of the greatest uh, films of that decade of the 40s. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson used it for his main inspiration for making There Will Be Blood. He, he had his crew, they watched it, he said, every night that they were actually in production just to get a sense for how John Huston shot this film and, and the tone and the characters and the style. And it's, it's really that impressive and it makes a lot of sense when you watch this film. You can be like, okay, I can feel There Will Be Blood in this. It's that sensational of a movie. Well, I'm looking at the list, Anthony, and I just realized that you left There Will Be Blood off this list. I wouldn't say it's a Western. I think There Will Be Blood's a thousand percent a Western. How's it not a Western? I think it's a Western. All right. So can we do two for one with number three here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> it came out the same year, too. Yeah. So another film in 2007. So in addition to There Will Be Blood, which I think has to be on this list. I must not have looked closely enough because I think There Will Be Blood's a hundred percent a Western. And then No Country for Old Men also came out in 2007, which is a thousand percent of Western as well. So these two movies we actually did an episode on, No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood, because I think they're so connected. Oh, yeah. Because they're both Westerns. But, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting. But we've done an episode. We did an episode on There Will Be Blood mm-hmm. a year and a half ago. It was incredible. I had such a great time talking Have about that. Have we done that. a solo one on No Country? No, we haven't done a solo episode on No Country for Old Men. I think that's something we'll have to do this year. Oh, wow. Absolutely. And No Country for Old Men, obviously, an 8.2 on IMDb, 93% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, 92% on Metacritic. And it's just one of the best films of the century, one of the best Westerns of all time. And then There Will Be Blood, tied for third place. An 8.2 on IMDb, also 91% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 93% on Metacritic. Two sensational films. No Country for Old Men is fits more of the meld of a gunslinging Western. We have not quite an outlaw, but we have, you know, someone who could have been an outlaw in a past life. It seems like, like he was. With Llewellyn yeah. Davis, he's got, a diff- he's got a very specific s- skill set. Many Western characters fought in wars. He's clearly a veteran of a war. He also can hunt. And he discovers a bunch of cash that has been left over after a gunfight in the middle of a desert where a drug deal went wrong. He's being pursued after taking this money by the villains, especially a merciless killer named Anton Chigurh, played by Javier Bardem, as well as the sheriff, played by Tommy Lee Jones. We all love this movie. It's incredible. Llewellyn Moss, great character from Josh Brolin, and directed by Ethan and Joel Cohen. Then There Will Be Blood. You know, we've talked about this movie so much on the show. You know how much we're huge fans of it. 
Clearly, Anthony doesn't like it because he didn't include it on this list. <laughs> Paul Thomas Anderson, one of the best filmmakers alive, one of the best all time for American filmmakers. A perfect script, a masterpiece piece of cinema, possibly the greatest film of the century, one of the greatest movies of yeah. all time with There Will Be Blood, and and maybe the best performance of all time from Daniel Day Lewis as Daniel Plainview. You who, say I say best a lot. Well, I mean, listen, this is legit. Listen to this guy. This is, this is legit, though. <laughs> and I said possibly the best. That's something I'd be willing to say. I think it might be the best performance I ever. I agree, yeah. And playing an oil tycoon after he finds his wealth from oil. Oil! Oil! In the deserts and just building his business and becoming one of the wealthiest people in the country. And it's an incredible character piece. You all have seen it. I'm sure you all have watched our episode on it and we talk so glowingly about it about it and how amazing of a movie it is. But I think these are two of the best Westerns ever made. Obviously, There Will Be Blood, we both agree, is a superior film. But, I mean, I can absolutely agree with No Country winning all those awards over it. Yeah. There, there Will Be Blood took actor and cinematography from, from Robert Elswit. And then No Country no got country Best cleaned Picture. Up. Yeah. Um, but it's they're both incredible films. What a year that both of these came out. It's unbelievable that both these films came yeah, out. Yeah, so 2007, we have these two. Then we have The Assassination of Jesse James. And also, we have 310 to Yuma. What a year. What a year. What a year for Westerns. Um, Atonement came out that year as well, which is a great film. Yeah, but I'm talking about specifically I know what you're Westerns. talking about. I understand. So clearly, you're conf- you ser- clearly, there's a lot of confusion about Anthony and what a <laughs> Western is. <laughs> Prime Prejudice is a Western, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, those tied for third place. So, well, I mean, since it's I not a bad tie. Why don't you do the final two, Anthony? All right. First up, we have <laughs> another film from Sergio Leone in 1969. Nice. <laughs> he came out with Once Upon a Time in the West, 8.5 on IMDb, 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 4.4 4 on Letterboxd. There's a single piece of land around Flagstone with water on it, and Rail Baron Morton aims to have it. Knowing the new railroad will have to stop there, he sends his henchman, Frank, played by Henry Fonda, excellent, excellent villain to scare the land's owner. McBain, but Frank... Kills him instead and pins it on the town bandit Cheyenne. Meanwhile, a mysterious gunslinger with a score to sell, Charles Bronson taking on the basically man with no name role that Clint Eastwood was famous for, and McBain's new wife Jill arrive in town. This is just a sensational example of filmmaking, of editing, of music, of acting. Uh, this has one of the best openings of all time, the train station arrival of Charles Bronson's character and the men waiting for him. Sound design of this film, phenomenal. Just all the facets of of making a film are to the highest degree in this movie. And unlike many of the westerns here, this is a deeply emotional one. This is, has a tragic backstory. The character is driven by by deep emotion, and he needs vengeance. The, the The desire for vengeance is well justified in this film, and has a very tragic couple of flashbacks, uh, which inform uh, why he's doing what he's doing. Henry Fonda is. Really excellent as the villain in this movie. One of the reasons why this movie is so high up on the list is because it is one of those great antagonists that really help excel the movie. Um, it's beautiful film. Really stunning. Uh, a great ensemble cast of characters. It lives up to all the hype. Um, it's just a remarkable film. I love it. Um, the harmonica, all of it. like Everything about Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, it's just a really beautiful score from Ennio Morricone. Um, some of the... A lot of music that Tarantino has used in his movies, um, Once Upon a Time in the West, I would say, is one of the most common um, films he'll draw. He'll pull music from from Ennio's, um, and it's just a remarkable piece of filmmaking from Sergio Leone. Really Latin great Kill Bill franchise. Yes. Yeah. All right, okay. Anthony. This, there, there's only one left on this list. It's pretty obvious, I think. Now, at number one, for the de- the best western of all time, we have another Sergio Leone film. <laughs> Which came out in 1967, and that is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. An 8.8 on IMDb. 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 90% on Critic Score. In the Southwest during the Civil War, a mysterious stranger and a Mexican out- outlaw form an uneasy partnership. Joe, played by Clint Eastwood, turns into the bandit for reward money, then rescues him just as he's being hanged. When Joe's shot at the noose goes goes awry during one escapade, a furious Tuco tries to have him murdered. The men reteam abruptly, however, to beat out a sadistic criminal 
in the Union Army to try and find $20,000 that a soldier has buried in the desert. And then Lee Van Cleef plays the colonel. And then, so Tuco and, and the man with no name, it's a great, charming relationship. They're both, they don't trust each other. Uh, they're antagonists to one another, but they form an alliance to help make money. And then they're like, okay, let's try and get this $20,000 that's buried. Uh, and then Lee Van Cleef plays uh, a, a, guns, a lone man who gets himself into the army so that he can also find this. The ugly. The ugly. This is just the epitome of the Western. It's the greatest example of the Western genre. Everything from the music to the, to the cinematography, the story, it's a, it's a huge epic, massive in scope. Tons of great set pieces. There's a lot of set pieces in this film. Incredible shootouts. A lot of good humor. Um, and then just, it, this is a movie where it feels like it's like a novel on screen. There's so many, so much depth to it. And there's so many pieces and, and little bits here and there. A little tiny subplot there and one there. And it just feels like an immense story. And it feels like you're going on an incredible adventure every time you watch it. And it culminates in... Um, one of the greatest scenes ever put on film, and that's the the finale, the trio. And this is just one of the greatest examples of film editing, cinematography, and music ever put on screen. It's just those three things. There's no dialogue. It's just editing, music, cinematography. That's it. And it is, without a doubt, one of the most suspenseful and thrilling seven minutes of all time. And culminates in a great ending. Uh, a really fun ending, too, the very, very ending. Um, I just love this film. One of my all-time favorites. I've, I've been a fan of it since I was like 18 when I saw it for the first time, and it lived up to all the hype, and it just gets better on rewatches. It's just a special film in the history of cinema. We should cover it soon. Absolutely. Number 10 on the IMDb all-time user rating list of Fuck cinema. Fuck yeah. Number 10. It's got like 2 million ratings, too. Over 800,000. 800,000, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a special movie. I'll never forget the first time I saw it. Back when I was like 14. When you were four. When I was what? <laughs> when you were four. <laughs> Austin big Butler, big fan. <laughs> Who was your favorite movie when you were kids? Uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. He got so much shit for it. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. The thing with the letterbox things, it's like when everyone does their four favorites. I feel like it's never authentic. People, they know they're gonna get asked that question, especially mm -hmm. now, especially young actors. They know they're gonna get asked the four favorites, and I feel like a lot of them strate like they strategically pick. I'm saying it's not Austin's favorite movie when he was a kid, but also the term "kid." He could be 13 or yeah, 14. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, doesn't I mean he's I six years Kill old. Bill when I was eleven. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, it doesn't Not every, have to be yeah. land before time. I think people are just being way too judgmental of people's top fours. Just way too judgmental. Like, just let he people... could have been watching the good, bad, yeah. ugly when he was nine. Who you don't knows? Know that. You it, don't fucking know. Here's the thing: is like you, like a bunch of the TikTokers who went after him and they went viral. It's like Austin Butler did not have the same life experience as you. You know, maybe his dad loves westerns and kept showing him westerns as a kid. You don't awesome. know that. You know what I mean? Just because he said good and the bad, bad and the ugly doesn't mean you have to feel threatened by it. Just because it's not a fucking like a movie that was made after 2005 yeah. or an animated feature, like yeah. it's fine. Like, yeah. my, one of my favorite movies was probably Jurassic Park when I was a kid. Yeah. When I was like eight years old. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's crazy, man. Dude. Let the man live his life. Predator? Leave the kid alone. Leave leave him alone. He's a great guy. Leave Austin alone. It's all, he's, he's, they're just peanut butter and jealous, man. He's killing it. Super peanut he's butter and jealous. It. He might be the... He's such a hot star right now. <laughs> yeah. Dude, after fucking Elvis and then Dune Part 2, he is one of my favorite actors right now. He's phenomenal. He's just going to he's gonna become the next 20 years huge. The, one he of the might biggest even surpass actors. Timothy Chalamet. He might. I mean, he has the potential. He's got it, man. He's really got it. Yeah. And I can't wait to see the bike riders, too. And Eddington. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be great. But, I mean, when, it, when, uh, when I heard that was his pick, I was like, based. <laughs> based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah! It's an amazing movie, and if you haven't seen the Good and the Bad and the Ugly, give it a watch, and you might understand why. Gosling did his recently. What do you do? His was great. Uh, he had Back to the Future. He had. Hold on, let me pull it up. So Blunt did it too. She did Jaws, Lawrence of Arabia, Gone with the Wind, and then uh, I can't remember the fourth one. That's great. Great list. But Gosling's were. He did a Bruce Lee film. The Bruce Lee film Ryan where the, the kid is. Uh, he did No Retreat, No Surrender. Yeah, that's the Bruce Lee film. Cocoon. <laughs> nice. Back to the Future. Uh -huh. And then Rocky. <laughs> fuck yeah. What a top Based. four. Based as fuck. I can't believe he has Cocoon in there. That's great. Yeah, that's a weird movie. Like when they um, they open their eyes and like the light comes out, like yeah. the aliens. It's a pretty creepy movie. No wonder. I mean, that's Guillermo, isn't it? 
Is it? Yeah. Oh, let me double check. I don't know. I feel like that is before Guillermo. Cocoon. I don't think that's Guillermo. 1985. Ron Howard. Oh, co- oh, never mind. I'm thinking of the other. Uh, Guillermo made something with a C. You're yeah. thinking of. Well, yeah, something. <sighs> yeah, it's one word. starts with a C. Yeah, I can't remember. But yeah. Cunt. <laughs> Mark Ruffalo, cut! <laughs> Hold on, that's gonna bother me. Guillermo, it's his first Kronos. movie, right? Kronos, that's what it is. Kronos, Kronos. That's is. not what I was thinking of, though. So yeah, I love that top four. Yeah, Rocky and Back to the Future. Fuck yeah, hell yeah, man, hell yes. Based Rocky is such an underrated movie nowadays. It is. No one talks about Rocky anymore. No, it's unbelievable. I think because Creed kind of took over the popularity, but the first Rocky movie, even oh, the second, second all one's four, great. the first four, are great. But the first one, it's an amazing movie. It is, yeah, it's an incredible film. Yeah, I mean, Best Picture winner. That movie, I could run through a brick wall after watching Rocky. Oh yeah, it's one of our most watched movies too. Definitely, we watched that's a movie we watched all the time when we were kids. Rocky all the time. was yeah. huge for us growing up. Yeah, absolutely. I love that pick from Gosling. My man, my man, my man. It gets cooler and cooler every year. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the 20 Best Westerns of All Time on Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Don't forget to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews so I get a tattoo of 5,000 Apple ratings, which will be a lot of fun. And share us with your family and friends. Take care, everybody. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly. Mark Nikaj. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.